Many people believe that Christianity was the perfect marriage between God's revelation to Israel and the philosophy of Plato. Justin wasn't a Jew, but he did come from Nablus, which is halfway between Galilee where the Lord ministered and Jerusalem where he was crucified. But he was a pagan who began his career by leaving his, his homeland and journeying to Rome in search of the true philosophy. Remember, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, the search for truth or logos that Socrates, Plato and Aristotle undertook for some was a kind of religious quest. The most basic translation of logos is word, but logos is really the entity that holds the whole world together. Logos gives it its meaning, its logic, it makes it not only understandable, but empowers us to actually understand it. And as the word, logos, is something we can speak accurately when we do understand it. Who wouldn't want logos? For a man like Justin, it was like a holy grail. Anyway, so Justin left Palestine to go to Rome in search of logos. As Justin tells us, there were five major philosophies on offer in his day. Platonism, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, Pythagoreanism and Epicureanism. He tried Stoicism first, but was disappointed when the Stoic only wanted to separate from bodily pleasures without necessarily seeking Logos. So he went to an Aristotelian next, who seemed more interested in money than in Logos. Then Justin left him for a Pythagorean, who refused to teach Justin philosophy until he studied mathematics. Justin scorned the Epicureans for being atheists, whose philosophy exalted bodily pleasure above all. So finally, he sought out the Platonists. Justin loved studying the Platonists. They taught him how to contemplate the great ideals of goodness, beauty, oneness and truth. Justin thought he would surely soon see God himself. But everything changed when Justin had a chance encounter one day with an old man on a beach. The old man rattled Justin's cage, pointing out some contradictions in Plato, especially with regard to the popular idea among Platonists in Justin's day, that is, reincarnation, which holds that souls lived forever in different bodies. But there was a problem. The old man asked, if after they see God, souls forget him and become reincarnated in earthly bodies, where is their eternal happiness? And if reincarnation was supposed to be a remedial punishment for sins committed in another life, how is this punishment remedial if no one can remember what sins they committed in earlier lives? These were hard questions that Justin could not answer. He told the old man that his whole purpose in studying Plato was to see God, to obtain Logos. But the old man refuted all the philosophers with one devastating question. How shall the philosophers judge truly about God when they do not know him, since they have never seen him nor heard him. Justin asked the old man where he had gotten his wisdom from. His response? It came to him directly through God's prophets who had no need of argumentation because they were first-hand witnesses of God and proved it by miracles. And when the old man spoke of Christ, Justin recounted Straight away, a flame was kindled in my soul, 
and the love of the prophets and the friends of Christ possessed me. And I found this philosophy alone to be profitable. Thus, and for this reason, I am a philosopher. For Justin, conversion to Christianity, to Christ, and to the true philosophy were one and the same thing. And this was the pattern by which many others after Justin were converted. In the first stage, they begin by seeking God and Logos through human reason alone, as though they can find it with enough study, enough contemplation and enough effort. Then stage two, they embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith. Then in stage three, they come to realize that the gospel of God is the only thing that can satisfy their intellects. The gospel reveals to them the very Logos they sought after. This was what made the gospel so very exciting to men like Justin. The gospel of John in its very first verses revealed Jesus Christ to be the Logos whom Socrates had sought after. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In a funny way, Socrates was a follower of Jesus Christ, though he didn't know him yet. What else did Justin Martyr do? Well, to tell you more, here's Jim. Thank you, Christine. Justin penned two documents called Apologies to the Roman Emperor to defend the Christian faith. Now, this kind of apology does not mean saying you're sorry for something. Rather, it means offering a defense for something. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, apologia was a well-established literary genre. One of Plato's dialogues is the Apology of Socrates, his defense of Socrates' character. Christian, Christians picked up this Greek literary format, and even the Bible uses the apology format. In the Acts of the Apostles, Paul makes two apologies for, or defenses of his faith. One is before Jews in Jerusalem, the other is before Festus and Agrippa in Caesarea. Now why did Justin Martyr feel the need to make a defense in the first place? The Roman Empire was killing Christians. The reasons were not that Romans hated Christ in and of himself. The Romans mostly don't care about Christians worshiping Christ. The Romans' view of Christians' beliefs and worship led them to charge Christians with three things. First, the Romans charged Christians with being atheists. Second, they charged Christians with being immoral. The Romans even said that they have incestuous orgies. Third, Romans charged Christians with cannibalism because they ate the flesh and blood of some man named Christos. So idolatry, immorality, and cannibalism. For these reasons, Rome considered Christians incorrect and to be a problem, a danger for the empire. Why did the Romans call Christians atheists? Not because they worshiped Christ, but because they wouldn't worship the Roman gods. Remember that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has come to us as Jesus Christ, this God demands exclusivity, that is, marriage-like covenant fidelity. He will not compete with other gods. Indeed, indeed, the later books of the Bible, after the Babylonian exile, reject the reality of other gods entirely. They are nothing but idols. That doesn't mean that they lose their allure at times, of course. But it does mean that even paying homage at a state temple to other fake gods to please the empire is one thing Christians can never do. The last command in the first epistle of John is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. In the Roman Empire, it was dangerous to refuse to worship pagan gods into state temples. The pagan ancient world believed that the world, including the security of the empire, was subject to the whims of small g gods. It didn't matter which pagan gods, or even if you believed in them, just that you offered them sacrifice. Now, if one didn't do that, bad things might happen. For instance, plagues, droughts, earthquakes, storms at sea, volcanoes erupting, and so on. So if bad things happened, people would blame Christian. As Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, explains in Truth and Tolerance, the empire saw itself as a religious entity as well as a state. It ran pagan temples for the protection of the empire as part of how it saw the order of things. 
Rome feared that the gods could get angry if they tolerated disrespectful people in their midst. Who wouldn't throw some incense on an altar, they thought. Christians needed to be punished for offending the gods. Furthermore, by this time, Rome honored the emperor, Caesar, as a god. Again, people didn't take the pagan, pagan deity system seriously as a truth claim or actually think the emperor was a god. But for the security of the empire, go along with the emperor, make him feel good, burn incense to his image. Now, Christians did not deny the legitimate functions of the state. Christians would pay taxes, follow laws, even in some cases serve in the military. But they would never honor Zeus or Apollo or the emperor as god. And so the empire called them atheists. And when they were martyred, people would yell, away with the atheists. That's the first problem. The other two problems the Romans had with Christians were the orgy and cannibalism canards. The Romans had heard about the Christians having love feasts, where the Christians loved the brothers and sisters, they ate the flesh of a man named Jesus. Which falsehoods, by the way, show you how important liturgy and the Eucharist were in the early church. Even what Romans got wrong pointed towards the truth. In the very early church, the Eucharist was hidden. The catechumens could attend the liturgy of the Word, but only baptized Christians were allowed to remain for the liturgy of the Eucharist, for the distribution of the body and blood of Christ. And Christians were not supposed to talk about it much either, certainly not with outsiders. Still, rumors leak out, and spies did infiltrate early Eucharists and the agape feasts. So Justin decided to break the secrecy of Christian liturgy and make an apologia for the Romans. He would clearly say what goes on in baptism in the Eucharist, but because he would be addressing a pagan audience, he wouldn't just use Christian language. He sought to translate it, describe it for them and he explained what the Eucharist is like. In the first apology, we find Justin's testimony of the Christian liturgy of baptism culminating in a Eucharistic celebration. He described the parts of the liturgy. One, continual reading of one biblical book. Two, homily by the president, ordained minister, on the readings. Three, prayers of the faithful. Four, the kiss of peace. Five, offertory procession of the gifts. Six, the president's spontaneous rendering according to a traditional pattern of a Eucharistic prayer responded to with an amen by the congregation. And seven, the distribution of the Eucharistic bread and wine, that is, the body and blood of the Lord, both to those present and absent. Justin actually used the past participle of the Greek verb Eucharistine, meaning to give thanks. And if you read this account of the Eucharist in Justin's first apology, you will see the Mass of Vatican II, today's ordinary form, which is not new. It's obviously older than Justin, but the written record of it goes back to Justin around 150 AD. But what about the scripture readings at Mass? Justin said that you have readings from the scriptures for as long as time allows. Then he said that the president of the assembly reads from the memoirs of the apostles. So by scriptures, Justin meant the Old Testament scriptures, the Gospels, and perhaps the Pauline letters. Now what we discover in this text is Justin's witness to the liturgical practice, particularly the Eucharist, which is connected to the ethical demands of Christian living. The Eucharist was not only believed to be Christ's real body and blood, Participation in the Eucharist was the Christian's pledge to live a life of sacrifice for God and neighbor, even if this meant accepting martyrdom. Justin writes, The President offers thanks at considerable length for your being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. There was finally also the charge of orgy and incest. Christians did celebrate agape feasts, i.e. love feasts with whole families. The rumor emerged that these were pagan feasts which lead into orgies. Justin said, you call us immoral? I mean, we have people in our midst who have lived continently, who have lived celibacy for years, their whole life. So he's a witness of the beauty of celibacy and he asserts it because he knows the pagans often admire self-restraint, but they are incapable of it. Christians offered a powerful witness of happiness and moral goodness. Justin also said, you know, we share our board, but not our bed. We share our belongings with each other, but we don't share our spouses. We're faithful until death with one spouse. Furthermore, you people, on the other hand, you accuse us of incest? No, you're the people who you have constantly going to prostitutes and who knows? They may be your own relatives because you and your family have fathered children who have been abandoned and now are grown up in brothels. So you're the people who are committing this horrible crime of incest. Now, so that's Justin's first apology. 
what else did he write? In the last video, we discussed the heresy of Marcion. Remember that Marcion was a Gnostic. He wanted to throw out the Old Testament and just worship Jesus as a revealer of divine knowledge, a secret Logos. But this reading is impossible. Jesus Christ makes no sense except as the incarnate person who came to fulfill what God had revealed and promised in the Old Testament. So this means that Christianity had to affirm the Old Testament because it was only through the scriptures that the resurrection of Jesus had meaning. But this truth in turn meant that Christians, like Jews, were going to keep rereading Old Testament books. Jews were also an established, known group in the Roman Empire, and so Christians and Jews had interesting interpretive disputes in the first few centuries about all sorts of matters, for instance, keeping or not keeping the Old Law, whether Jesus Christ is really the Messiah or not, and how the Old Testament scriptures can or cannot be understood in light of Jesus. While he was in Ephesus, Justin had a dispute with a Jewish man named Trypho. Justin documented this dispute in his dialogue with Trypho. Justin's argument has three main points, that the Old Covenant is passing away to make way for the New, the Logos is the God of the Old Testament, and the Gentiles are the New Israel. Justin clearly argues for continuity between the Old and New Testaments and that the true interpretation of the Old Testament is found in light of Christ. As for why God had many laws before in the Old Covenant and fewer now in the New Covenant, or why he revealed things in stages rather than all at once, Justin develops the Pauline idea of God's economy, that is, God's orderly historical plan that has come together in Christ. Justin also asserted the related idea of divine condescension, that God reveals himself in time but only according to the measure in which human beings can receive that revelation. We will see that these two important ideas would get developed later by Irenaeus, who was a student of Justin. But Justin introduces them into the body of patristic teaching. Probably the most important takeaway from Justin is his approach to philosophy. Now in Greek, philosophia means love of wisdom. That is the pursuit of wisdom about the contemplation of God, being, human nature, and the world by unaided human reason. That is the philosophy of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and many other lesser figures. Rome actually considered Christianity and Judaism to be forms of philosophy because they made truth claims about God, human nature, and the world. We've already seen that there can be bad philosophical ideas. For instance, Marcion's Gnostic-inspired ideas to drop the Old Testament, or the Greek and Near Eastern paganism that wanted to deny the fleshiness of the body of Jesus. These were examples of culture being allowed to corrupt the gospel. We will see that some thinkers like Tertullian wanted to reject philosophy for that reason. They thought it was too dangerous. But what we see here in Justin Martyr is that there's overlap or participation between the wisdom of reason and the revealed gospel. You have to be able to make points of contact with the culture and you must be able to incorporate what's good into the culture, into the Catholic tradition, into the theological tradition, into worship, into life. That's challenging work. And who does that for the first time that we know of, at least in writings that have survived for us to study, is Justin. Justin argued that there are logoi spermaticoi, or seeds of the word, in the world. They are a point of commonality between divine revelation and the natural order. Justin was already a highly cultured man before he became Christian. He was speaking to the culture publicly. So he discussed the problem of Christ and culture. Remember the heresy of Docetism that Ignatius dealt with. Docetism is just one version of Gnosticism, which is the oldest and most stubborn of heresies because it is always cropping up in different forms. The essence of Gnosticism was we need some form of special knowledge to escape this world which is understood as a prison. Gnosticism sees salvation as being our ability to escape the material world after we die and make it back to a kind of highest heaven that we had come from. That The appeal of Gnosticism is chronic. Do you ever feel like you don't belong in this world, that somehow you don't fit? Gnostics would say that is because you don't. Most people in their view are ordinary in a sense of dull and fleshy. But, but you, they say, have a spark of the divine in you that got trapped in a body by a horrible mistake. After these people die, they would just be nothing. But after you die, they say, you have a shot of living on. 
your spirit has to make its way back to the highest heaven, but there's all sorts of evil demigods in between, and you need special knowledge to navigate by them. And so they argue a heavenly messenger has come to us to give us these, let's call them passwords, to get by these blockers, to get out of the realm of the lower darkness in the lower air to the higher realms of light. And so Christian Gnostics made Jesus into a figure who descends from heaven. They said he didn't die from, for us. Rather, he came to bring us hidden knowledge. And anyway, this heresy of Gnosticism was very widespread in the mid-2nd century. It was the biggest battle that the church faced. Because Gnosticism divine, de defined a universal problem with the world and offered an escape from that problem, it could very easily attach itself to Christianity. Put differently, it takes the veneer or outer appearance of Christianity and drapes it over a pagan world portrait or belief system. So Justin, in response, found logoi, logoi spermaticoi, seeds of the word and points of contact. Paul had done the same thing at the Areopagus of Athens as described in Acts 17. Paul pointed out that one of their altars had the inscription to an unknown God. He explained, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything, he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said. The text explains that Paul continued proclaiming the gospel among them, and then some men believed and joined him. So Paul saw that there was something noble and true there, right within the pagan thought, and he made contact. Like the Greeks in the Areopagus, Justin had found the, that truth to some degree even before he found the fullness of truth in Christ. As a Christian, Justin made contact with that truth, the accepted valid insights of Greco-Roman philosophy. He didn't take off his philosopher's robe when he became a Christian. Instead, he came to understand that, Je that Jesus Christ is the Logos, the very thing that men like Socrates were looking for and never quite found. Jesus is not just the founder of a new religion. He is the key to understanding all that is. He's the Logos, the divine word. Justin wondered, why did Plato get so much right? In one place he said that, be, play, that was because Plato plagiarized the prophets and didn't give credit, and rather stole stuff from them. While this may not be true, Plato did have something in common with the prophets. Philosophers who live in accord with reason, those who live in accord with the Logos, are living in accord with Christ. As the Second Vatican Council tells us, this is the basis for the possibility that non-Christians may be saved. By seeking the truth, even if they make mistakes along the way, they are seeking the Logos, the thing that holds everything in being. By seeking the Logos, they are seeking Christ. Somehow in a way known to Christ, he might save them. So to wrap up, these are the essence of Justin's, Justin's teaching. He offered a forthright defense of the faith that left us an enormously important record of what ancient liturgies looked like. He made a serious attempt to wrestle with the question of how Jesus Christ is two things at the same time. Christ is both the fulfillment of the, Old, of the Old Testament's promises and he is the realization of the hopes and dreams of men like Socrates who desired above all the truth that is the eternal Logos.